Hey there, how's it going? Welcome to Dominions 5. My name is Mew, this time around I'm going to be playing a multiplayer game set in the Late Age, and I'm going to be playing as Jomon. This video is going to be the intro for this series, so in this video I'll just talk a little bit about Jomon, and then I'll show off the god that I chose, the scales that I chose, and the bless that I went with. And then finally I'll talk a little bit about the game settings, the map, and the mods and stuff. And then the next video going up in this series will be turn 1-3. to three. So if you just want to see gameplay, you can skip this video and wait for that one. Before anything else, I'd also just like to say a big thank you to my Patreon supporters for helping to keep me making these videos over the last few years. I really appreciate you guys. And if you're interested in that, you can find it linked in the description below. And as for the rest of you, uh, remember to engage with the YouTube algorithm. Alright, now that that's out of the way, let's talk about Jomon. So here we are, Late Age Jomon. I do not play much Late Age. It is my least favourite age. There is exactly one Late Age game of Dominions 5 on the channel, and it is Raga. And I remember in the Raga game looking for magic sites and not finding any magic sites. And that is my prevailing <laughs> understanding of Late Age. It's an age where you have no gems, which I don't find terribly fun. But yeah, the, the kind of rule of thumb with Late Age is that you have mages who have generally more paths, but at lower levels. And you have units that are better equipped than in other eras, so higher quality arms and armor. Provinces usually have higher population, so you get a lot more income, but sites are less frequent, meaning that gem income is less frequent, so there's less... Uh, yeah, less, less playing around with magic in Late Age is generally the uh, theme, I think. And yeah, the, the Raga game I played sort of put me off a little bit, because I do remember struggling a lot to find gems in that game. But we'll revisit. Maybe, I, maybe I've been too harsh on Late Age, let's give it another shot. Um, Gem 1's also pretty funny because this is the first nation I played in Dominions 4. Uh, in fact, I think it's the first nation I recorded videos of, back when I was just uh, <laughs> playing around with videos. I, I started making videos originally just because I wanted to encourage other people on uh, something awful to make videos. I wanted our, our top players to make videos I could watch and learn from, uh, which was my only intention back then. Uh, and it worked as well, I got Nuclear Monkeys to start making videos, I'm pretty sure. So, <laughs> so there we go, you know, paid off. At first glance, Jomon is certainly a nation that you will enjoy if you are a two-handed weapon enjoyer. Um, perhaps you'd like to recruit a Samurai, who has Samurai armor, a Kabuto, and an Aganata, which is a big two-handed weapon. Or maybe you'd prefer a Samurai, who has Samurai armor, a Kabuto, and a Katana, which is a big two-handed weapon. Maybe you'd like to recruit an Oban, who has heavy samurai armor, a Kabuto and a Katana. Or uh, perhaps a Go Hatamoto, who has heavy samurai armor, a Kabuto, and a Nodachi, which is a big two other weapon. Uh, perhaps you'd like an Akaoni Samurai, which has samurai armor, a Kabuto, and a Katana, which is a big two handed weapon. Or maybe one of your sacreds, like the Sohei, who has samurai armor, a Kabuto, and a Naganata, which is a big two handed weapon. Uh, you're really spoilt for choice if you are a guy who enjoys big two-handed weapons. If you don't, then look elsewhere, this is not the nation for you. No one also has really simple and straightforward mages to recruit, which I'm always grateful for. Sometimes I look at nations like, um, I'm thinking of Pythium as I say this. Sometimes I look at nations and they have too many commanders. Bro, what the f I think to myself, how am I ever going to know which commanders I should be recruiting? Uh, Jomon, nice and simple. You have Shigenges and you have Master Shigenges who have exactly the same picks. The only difference being that the Masters come with E1 and N1 by default and get two picks, and the little ones only come with E1 and only get one pick. So they're just a straight upgrade and they just do exactly the same thing. Nice and simple, nice and straightforward. And then for a bit of variety, you've also got Omiogis who come with S2, but then also have the same picks. So, you know, <laughs> nice and simple. These mages are slower to recruit, they also have a much higher max age as well, which is interesting. And they're escorted by a Shikigami. Besides that though, uh, very similar mages, very easy to know what you're going to be recruiting. Very straightforward. I always appreciate that. Unit-wise, um, you know, take your pick of which armoured two-handed weapon carrying infantry unit you would like. Uh, I'm probably just going to be recruiting Sohei's in the game. Uh, we have two sacreds that we can recruit. We have the Soheis who are not undisciplined, carry a Naganata. 
And we have the Ambushis who are undisciplined and carry a katana instead. Uh, they also have mountain survival though, which is quite nice. Otherwise they are very, very, very similar. The Sohei's benefit from requiring slightly fewer resources as well. So with that in mind, I'm probably just going to be recruiting Sohei's out of my cap every turn. Because we're more likely to be locked on resources than anything else, I think. In fact, we're more likely to be locked on holy points over anything else, but after that we'll be probably be locked on resources. Um, so probably going to recruit nothing but Sohei's out of my cap when I can. Outside of my fort, I'm not sure, probably just archers though. We do have a pretty good samurai archer who comes with a range 45 longbow. So it's likely we're going to do Sohei's out of our cap, longbows out of our exterior forts. And that's about it, I'm not sure what we might need the other units for. Uh, but maybe we'll find a use for them. We do have a fairly nice looking cavalry unit which might be a bit of a luxury at some point. And we have one of our samurais who is a standard bearer, and standards are always pretty useful. Might mix a few of those in with the army. I think in terms of commanders and units, our recruitment options are going to be quite straightforward. We do get H2s recruit anywhere which is quite nice, so always useful for blessing troops. And we have some very good leaders as well if we ever need that. The daimyos are plus two for four with 120 leadership, so yeah, really, really good leaders if we need that. Shouldn't have any morale problems. Our sacreds have like, what, 15 base morale, and then we've got a standard unit and a plus two morale unit commander, so pretty good for morale. Should be nice. One thing I do remember about Jomon is that they can build forts underwater, which is unusual for a land nation. Uh, and if you are able to get underwater and you do build a fort, you get special uh, units you can recruit and mages you can recruit as well. The Ryujin. Uh, the Ryujin are far and away the best mages that you can recruit. They all come with water too, and then they get bonus water from the pearl that they all come with as well. So they're all water three mages with a free temporary water gem, and then they get a joined plus two pick in fire, air, earth, or nature. So very powerful mages. They're also extremely mobile with 34 map movement and flying. They can shapeshift into a even more draconic looking dragon, which has about twice as many hit points. They come with plus five in all of the resists. In fact, they've got 15 poison resistance. So this is an extremely mobile, very durable, free gem carrying, <laughs> powerful mage that, uh, you know, you can fly around and do so. I mean, you could even thug these guys out if you really wanted to. We got a bunch of attacks, full item slots in bipedal form. Pretty good combat stats, amazing magic resistance. I mean, yeah, these um, these mages are sick. If you can get underwater and start recruiting Ryujin, Jomon is significantly better. That is the the big Jomon tip. If you cannot do that, if you cannot get underwater, Jomon is significantly worse. <laughs> so uh, you know. Make sure you do the pro thing and start near some water. Don't be a noob and start inland. That would be terrible. Now, this game is running the Jaybrighton Balance mod, so I think one of the changes we get actually is that we have coastal starts. I could be wrong about that. But I'm pretty sure that's a thing in JBBM and not in vanilla. Um, so that would be nice if we do start on a coast. Or at least near some water, right? That would be ideal. Um, besides that, there aren't many changes to Jomon in JBBM. So I'll just uh, mention briefly, our ninjas cost two recruitment points instead of one. Uh, that's a general change to assassins in JBBM. So in the balance mod that we're using, there's no such thing as a an assassin that only needs one rec point. So at a minimum they're two. If they have magic, they probably have even more than that. Another change is that our Kanushis have throw salt. Pretty sure that's going to be a game changer. Uh, <laughs> you'll see a huge amount of use from that one. And besides that, I think the only big change is that some of our units have like one additional hit point. I think in base, a lot of Jomon troops have nine hit points for some reason. So we've been we've been bumped up to human hit points from subhuman hit points. So yeah, that's nice. Uh, I'm not sure what these guys are. I'm pretty sure the Ashigaru were on nine hit points usually. But we got like an extra hit point on our dudes. I believe that is the sum total of changes to Jomon in this balance mod though. Or maybe the uh, fort things as well. Forts produce 50% more resources. I think that might be a balance mod change as well. Besides that, we are functionally identical to Jomon in vanilla, so you should be able to follow along pretty well. There will of course be some sort of more general changes that will affect the nation, but I'll try to mention them when they come up. Uh, this game's also going to be running the snow.dm mod, so you may have noticed all of our units have snow movement. Um, that goes for literally everything. 
that's just from the snow.dm mod. In fact, I think that's been renamed to like the ski mod or something. So, so every single unit in the game just has snow movement to uh, diminish the downside of taking cold scales, basically. There's Germon in brief, though. Uh, I'll show off the god I made next. So Germon is worshipping Quality Gift at Phenomenal Price, the Celestial Dragon. Uh, we are an S10 A2 Celestial Dragon with an Etherealness Bless, and we are awake. Uh, the goal with this is going to be very simple. I've decided to stop trying to play nations according to their strengths, and instead play them according to my strengths. So I prefer having an awake god, and I prefer expanding as quickly as possible in the early game. That's kind of a crutch for my playstyle, and I think it works well. And I think what pairs really well with that is if you take an Awake Expander and then you slap a really big path on it so that you can get up some kind of defensive global. So that really helps you then because you expand quickly, you get big, you try to research quickly, and then you put up a defensive global to keep you safe. I tried that in the Iru game that I just did. I'm still in it, technically, but um, that strategy doesn't white go the way I intend it to because I struggle to get globals up. But I think in principle it's a good fit for my playstyle. So we're going to do the same thing again here with the Celestial Dragon. The Celestial Dragon is slightly changed in the balance mod we're running. So this is quite buffed over vanilla. I think the biggest change is that it has recuperation. So it actually heals afflictions over time. Um, which makes it a much much better expander generally. But I think this strategy would probably still work anyway in vanilla because the Celestial Dragon just does not get take any damage when it's expanding. Um, but we get Recuperation, we also get Ore as well, which is another change in JPBM, so that's pretty cool. So we're a much better expander because of that. We also get slightly better attacks as well. Um, in the balance mode that we're running, all of the monstrous pretenders, they get their weapons upgraded so that they are longer range. So that they're not like completely useless length zero things that's... Uh, <laughs> Uh, cause problems for you. So the chassis is slightly buffed in the balance mode we're running. Besides that though, this chassis with the etherealness bless just doesn't really take damage. Our base protection is pretty good to begin with and then we also get fear which you know puts things off attacking us for very long. But then when paired with ethereality we just we just don't take damage. And if we go up alteration research early on we can also take mist form. Um, so we put that over the top of ethereal as well. Nothing's going to hit this guy when we're expanding in our Dominion. Um, he has very, very free expansion early on. He also has the luxury of being an amphibian, so he can take water provinces for us too. This, of course, is extremely important for Jomon because if we see any water province that is within our grasp, we need to get into it immediately. Because if people can stop us getting underwater, they probably should, since our nation is significantly better if we're underwater and significantly worse if we're not. Um, Etherealness is also a pretty good bless for our sacreds as well. Um, our sacreds are, you know, they're, they're not bad in terms of their defense. Their protection's okay. They've got good combat stats. They don't have shields though, which is a bit of a problem. So if every single sacred we, we can recruit is ethereal, that's also going to help during expansion. It's going to help in early wars as well. Um, we have a bunch of, of uh, sacred units we can also summon to flying Tengu units. They're also going to benefit quite a bit from Etherealness because they have pretty low protection, if I remember rightly. So Etherealness helps them tank up a little bit. Um, it's going to be useless against magic, but in early to mid-game stuff, Etherealness is going to be a pretty sick bless. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, hang on, this guy said he wants to expand quick and then get up a defensive global. What defensive global is he planning to put up? Uh, you guessed it, it's Strands of Arcane Power. We have Magic 3. And traditionally I do not do much research in games, and I struggle to get research done, but I'm trying to play a bit differently. And I did quite a bit of research in the Euro game, which again is still going. I, uh, I'm talking about it like it's finished, it's not, it's only like halfway through. Um, so don't worry, there's uh, <laughs> there's plenty of Iru to watch if you're wondering. Um, yeah, we're going to try to get all the way up to Evocation 9 as an early target and put up Strands of Arcane Power. I have never even seen that global in a game. Okay, as I was editing this, I realized I have actually seen Strands of Arcane Power in a game, haven't I? Quite recently, it was the Magic Gen game. But I guess in my defense, Magic Gen games don't really count, okay? In a real game, I don't think I've ever seen Strands of Arcane Power. But you know what? I could be wrong. I could be wrong. I guess my memory isn't very good for stuff like that. But uh, okay, I just thought I'd point out, technically I have seen it in a game, 
but it was a Magic Gin game, so it doesn't count. Alright? Alright, back to the video. In fact, if you've never seen that global in a game, what it does is it, first of all, it makes all of your provinces just get automatically site searched for the person who cast its paths. So in this case, we'll just auto search for Astral and Earth sites. Um, it also means that every single mage that enters your dominion gets mind burned for 10 damage. Which sounds pretty sick, however, it has the potential to evil mind your caster. <laughs> um, if you try to mind burn an enemy astral caster in your dominion, you get engaged in a, in a, in a mental battle and uh, the loser gets evil minded. I think that's probably pretty safe for us though because we have astral 10 and the likelihood that we lose some kind of mental battle with Astral 10 is pretty low. It might be impossible to lose. I'm not sure how it works exactly. Um, but I'm going to feel pretty safe if we can get up Strands of Arcane Power. It seems like a funny plan um, because that seems like an odd target to rush and it's a global I've never seen before. So I think we should try to pull it off. So that's the kind of overarching plan. We're going to get really big quickly. We're going to try to get lots of research done. And we're going to try to hit Strands of Arcane Power as an early target. Is that feasible? Is it doable? Is it reasonable? Will it be effective? All of these questions and more will hopefully be answered in the course of the game. Uh, watch this space to see if we pull it off. Now, in order to get an Awake God with 10 levels of magic, we do have to dump our skills quite a bit. Um, there isn't much to say here though, because yeah, this is just uh, what it costs. We don't need much in the way of skills because we're only really gonna be recruiting sacreds out of our capital. So we're going to be locked at six points of Dominion, which is, you know, we can recruit six units, basically. So we need enough recruitment points and enough resources and enough gold to recruit six units each turn, basically, for the early game. We'll get that with these skills, that's fine. Uh, we can partner our turmoil with luck, which is always fun. And hopefully we get some big gold events. Pairing luck with a bunch of bad skills is usually pretty nice anyway, so... Yeah, the, the hope is that we get enough gold events from luck that it, it floats us a bit. And we'll have a bit of freedom to do what we need to do. But yeah, we're not going to be very wealthy overall. Uh, we're probably just going to be recruiting Sohays out of our capital and a couple of archers out of our exterior forts each turn. And that's about it. We're going to be relying on our big bless on our sacreds and our awake god to protect us in the early game. And then once we reach the kind of mid game, we can summon quite a lot of units. So having poor scales and poor recruitment doesn't actually hurt you that much. Um, as long as you have gem income, and that's going to be the big thing. Do we have the gem income to support sort of going heavy on summons and magic in the middle game? Uh, I don't know. I guess we'll find out. Magic sites were very scarce in the Raga game I did, so this might not work out very well overall, but we'll give it a shot. So a couple of things we would like to see in this game. First of all, we really need to start near some water so that we can get underwater, get our Ryujin production going. The next thing we would like to see is some neighbors who don't have magic weapons. I think there's quite a few nations in the late ages that get magic weapons, which would be a shame because if we have small neighbors after our expansion's done that don't have any easy way to get early magic damage, uh, we should be able to walk over them pretty easily with an Ethereal Bless. Ethereal Bless is really scary if you don't have magic weapons or magic spells early on because it's very, very difficult to hit units that are ethereal. Especially when I can just, you know, Divine Blessing and suddenly, you know, 80 units are all ethereal. Um, that's really good as well when our, you know, our god can be ethereal if we're fighting in Dominion. All those Ryujin mages that are flying around can be ethereal if they get blessed and so on. So, yeah, we want to start near a coast. We want to have neighbors who don't have any magic weapons. And we want to find lots of magic sites. If we get those three things, we should have quite a bit of fun through the mid game. I'm going to try and get lots of research done. And then we are also a, an air and a fire nation, so we can forge lots of boosters too for uh, research. So we can forge alquils early on to help our research and lightless lanterns a bit further after that to help our research. So yeah, I'm going to really try to get strands of arcane power up as early as I can, because I think that would be very funny. Uh, so let's see if we can pull it off. That's the god though. Uh, not much more to say besides that. I have already mentioned the mods used in this game quite a bit, so you probably don't have to repeat it, but I will say that if you're interested in the J. Barrett and Balance mod, there is a link to it in the description, as well as a link to the Google Docs thing that tells you what all the changes are, if you want to look through what some of the other changes are. Uh, I'll also put a link to the Snow Movement mod, 
as you can see here, my god also gets the snow movement bonus. Uh, everything does. The map that we're going to be playing on is... I'm not sure if it has a name. Actually, I might check that. Hang on. I can't remember what map it is that we're playing on. Oh right, we're playing on Lake Fried Shrimp. Okay, cool. So we're playing on Lake Fried Shrimp. If you play Dominions on the Ruby Discord, that is one of the named maps we use a lot. It is a map I think was generated in Dominions 4 using the in-game map generator. I could be wrong though. So not much to say there. I can't link you to the map generator that made it since it was just Dominions that made it. Uh, but there we go. And I think that pretty much covers everything. Uh, you might be a bit confused here why we have our special pearl even though we have two miscellaneous slots open. You might be wondering, does that mean I get three miscellaneous slots in this mod? Uh, no, that's just a display bug in just in base Dominions 5. For some reason when you look at a pre-made pretender that has an item, it just it, it goes in like a in a nothing slot. I don't know if you can see that the text at the bottom it says it's in the nothing slot. <laughs> That's just a Dominion's bug. Um, no, we still only have two miscellaneous slots. Uh, ignore that. All right, that's everything. So I'll leave it there. Uh, next time you hear from me, it will be turn one to three. So look forward to that. If you do enjoy the series or any of the series on the channel, please consider liking the video and subscribing and all that good stuff. Thanks either way for watching. Hope you enjoy it. And uh, hopefully I'll see you in the next video.